In today's episode of the Iman Wire podcast. All the historical evidence suggests that the Quran is a document that comes from the mid 7th century from Western Arabia, you know, basically from the time of the Prophet. Now, you might not believe it's revelation, but there's really no evidence that it's anything but this document that comes from that one time period. And it essentially hasn't gone through any changes since then. And what evidence there is of diverse, let's say, diversity in reading or in understanding is not uncovered by non-Muslim scholars. It's actually transmitted and preserved by Muslim scholars. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Manwar Podcast. Salim here. Join my co-host, Irfan. Assalamu alaikum. Hey, Assalamu alaikum, Salim. How's it going? Alhamdulillah, I'm glad to have you here, and we're uh, we're glad to have back another a guest we've had in the past, um, our uh, dear Dr. Jonathan Brown. Assalamualaikum. Assalam. So I think uh, one of the topics I wanted to kind of bring up was the idea of when we say mushaf, and when you look at the literal meaning, it means this collection of pages, and so. Muslims may be familiar with the fact that different sahabas, different who people who are scribes to the uh, Prophet ﷺ, were writing down a revelation as it came, but maybe fuzzy on some of those details. And then obviously the idea of this codex and this chronological timeline. Um, so when we talk about the timeline of how the Quran was actually put together, but also the development it has and how that kind of informs our own sense of faith in the sacred scripture as we look towards the future. Mm -hmm. So kind of wanted to get your take first on, you know, maybe helping us as an audience define what is Mm Al-Mus'haf and and why it becomes so synonymous with the ver, like with the Quran itself. Yeah. Well, um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I mean, I think it's interesting to ask, you know, what the Quran is. And um, I mean, there's a Muslim scholars have defined it in a number of ways. You could say, you know, the Quran is the word of God. Uh, you could say, you know, in the Arabic language, uh, uh, revealed to the Prophet Muhammad um, by the agent, you know, through the medium of uh, the angel Gabriel. Um, you could say that the Quran is uh, the uncre- you know, uncreated word of God would be the general the Sunni position. Um, uh, if it's created, it doesn't mean it's not revelation. It just means that it's, you know, it's not eternal. It's something God creates as opposed to being... Which something. is like the Mutazala. Yeah, you know, or the, or the uh, 12 or Shia position. Um and uh, but another interesting way is you know Al Ghazali uh, Imam Al Ghazali has a definition. I think it's uh, Al Quran ma ma bina dafate al al mushaf wasal wasal ilayna bitawatir. Right. So the Quran is what is between the two covers of the mushaf that came to us by massively parallel transmission. So that's the you know, that's an interesting definition of the Quran <laughs> because it actually says like the Quran is what's in the mushaf that came to us that's arrived to us by massive diverse. A parallel chains of transmission. So there was no like coercion. There was no no. So the idea is that there's nobody like basically you know like we're not missing it because yeah, it's, it's the same thing from generation uh, to generation. You know, it's, it's it's historical attestation is is absolutely certain. And I think that's you know uh, one of the things that's most interesting about the Quran is that is the historical reliability. And you know because I'm a you know professor I do in Islamic studies and you know I deal with a lot of um, uh, the kind of Western histor- historical criticism of the Quran. And uh, the bottom line is that there's just not that much because the, you know, Western scholars are since the, essentially since the, the 1800s, you know, they, they assume that, um, and a lot of, some of them still assume that the Quran sort of has the same history as the b- biblical scripture. And the b- b- biblical scripture, of course, comes together over a period in the, in the case of the Old Testament of, you know, over a thousand years. In the case of the New Testament, you know, um, around 300 years. And so the idea is, you know, oh, well, it goes through a historical process and it changes and people delete stuff and they add stuff and they edit stuff and they doctor stuff. But, uh, and so they just keep assuming that's the case with the Quran. But uh, all the historical evidence suggests that the Quran is a document that comes from the mid 7th century from Western Arabia, you know, basically from the time of the Prophet. Now, you might not believe it's revelation, but there's really no evidence that it's anything but this document that comes from that one time period. And it essentially hasn't gone through any changes since then. And what evidence there is of diverse, let's say, diversity in reading or in understanding is not uncovered by non-Muslim scholars. It's actually transmitted and preserved by Muslim scholars in their study of the different readings of the Quran. So I think, you know, there's, uh, 
uh, in the, the, the 1970s, um, there was this stash, I think 1979, there was this stash of uh, old documents that were found in the, the, basically like a crawl space above the roof of the great mosque in Sana'a in Yemen. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, this word. Because, you know, pre-modern Muslims, uh, they didn't throw away stuff that had the name of God written on it. it know what to do with it so they would you know burn it or something like that or they'd stick it just in some weird place <laughs> um almost like me and tax records <laughs> <laughs> stuff it in some drawer or toys man. yeah like so that. the so the uh and so they found this and they there were some of these really really early um musaf pages and some of them had written they were called what's called a palimpsest a palimpsest is a a text where there's something written and then underneath that there was something pre previously written because if you're using parchment or papyrus these are very expensive and they're also not like paper they don't like soak up the ink the ink kind of rests on the surface so you can actually just wipe off the ink and reuse it but uh using things like you know um, ultraviolet light and stuff like that, you can actually read what, what was written previously underneath that so they found one palimpsest that had this re it was like very supposedly very early page of the quran and this was, you know, in the late 1990s, I think it was 1999, there was an Atlantic Monthly article. Yep. I don't remember this, you know, like it was this magnifying glass, like cutting into the Quran. <laughs> like, what is the Quran? Like scholars have to be so careful. And right. I, it's like basically every year there'll be some newspaper article about this. Like, yeah, every year. Someone found like a stash of Mus'haf somewhere and like finally the truth of the Quran is going to be revealed. And then it turns out it's nothing, uh, nothing new, right? So, but this, <clears throat> this uh, actually when, the, the German scholar who had this palimpsest page from the Sana manuscripts uh, refused. He kept saying like, oh, this is going to blow the lid off everything. Oh my God, it's going to tear the whole system down. <laughs> and no, nothing ever happened. And then finally, this one uh, scholar at Stanford, uh, Behnam Sadiqi, he actually got it and did a, like a critical edition of it, wrote an article about it. And here's the interesting thing. Not only is it, it's very early. He concludes it's very early. It's actually pre-Uthmanic codex. So it's, it comes from before around 650 common era when uh, the Caliph Uthman uh, issues this, promulgates the official copy of the Quran and destroys all the other Mus'hafs. So this actually comes from before that. But here's the thing. It's not any different than the, it's essentially not any different from the Uthmanic Codex. So Uthman sends out these, these Mus'hafs to the different garrison cities of the Muslim empire. And between these different masahif, there's like sometimes slight, there's like a wow, like an and is missing or something like that. Right. That's the same. That's Those differences are no more than the difference between this pre-Uthmanic palimpsest masahif and those Uthmanic masahifs. And so uh, another thing that's interesting is like, for example, how is the Quran? So we know the Quran gets revealed, uh, the, you know, the his history is that the Quran gets revealed by the by God through the angel Gabriel to the prophet. But of course, this, the, the Quran that we have is not ordered chronologically. No. Yeah. Right? It's essentially ordered from longest to shortest surah. Right, which is like, which is one of the big frustrations for a lot of, of people who approach the Quran. Yeah, but so the question is like, well, how did this happen? So the Muslim, his, our historical reports say that the prophet, lay salam, basically... Uh, ordered the verse. Some, you know, some whole verses came, some surahs came down as whole surahs. Right. Some surahs came down and, you know, a big chunk of it was kept, you know, came down at one time or a big, or a little chunk of it came in. Then the prophet would like move that around right. or sometimes like a verse, he'd insert a verse here and insert a verse there. And the idea, of course, from a Muslim perspective is this is all inspired by God. Um, but what's interesting is there's actually some reports in our history, in Islamic history, that the final ordering of the Quran was not done by the prophet, it was done by the, the, the companions in the early chaos right after his death. Right. Now, what's interesting about this is that because this uh, Sana Palimpsest is actually ordered the same way as the Uthmanic Codex, it suggests that, and this is the, the, the author of the article's conclusion, he suggests that actually it was the prophet who uh, ordered it. Yeah, why would they be similar? Basically, yeah, exactly. Right? So it's, when what's interesting is not only does, does this supposed thing that was going you know, to blow the lid off everything. Not only does it not blow the lid off anything, but it actually <laughs> confirms historical accuracy of not just the Muslim history, but actually the most kind of conservative Muslim history. Not right. even... Uh, so then uh, what... There's a really interesting article in... Um, there was, I think, a journal of the uh, Bolton School of uh, African Oriental Studies, I think about two years ago. It's a two-part article by a scholar from Oxford named Nicholas Sinai. And uh, he, I think he's German, 
he uh, basically has two really long articles. And the end of the conclusion is that um, until somebody actually gets some decent evidence, the, 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 the history that we should be assuming to be the kind of state of the field is basically the Muslim history of the Quran. Right. Right. And that there's no one's really been able to bring any evidence to suggest that that's not true. And then uh, just the first issue of Journal of American Oriental, not uh, sorry, the Journal of the Academy, American Academy of Religion, Journal of the American Academy of Religion, which is generally completely illegible. Like even <laughs> I read this, it's like this hardcore religious studies stuff. It's utter nonsense. But there's a really good article by a guy named Jonathan Brockup, the first issue of 2017 of the journal. It's called, I think the Islamic History and Incidental Normativity, I think is the name, the title of the article. Wow, that is complicated. <laughs> and what he, what he argues is that, again, when it comes to the Quran and sort of early Islamic history, that unless you have some evidence that can really stand up to the general Muslim history of the Quran, then stop making these claims about, you know, oh, I'm disproving everything. Oh, we have the real, we've discovered the truth because you bring evidence that is not convincing, not solid. And uh, sometimes, by the way, the theories are so cockamamie right. mm -hmm. that they make, you know, these Western scholars are always saying, oh, Muslims are there, they are, everything is based on faith, not evidence. The <laughs> theories are so cockamamie, they take more faith to believe than the actual Muslim version. But it's almost like they're viewing us through their own prism, obviously. Definitely. So, I mean, that, definitely. Always, so it's their case, own yeah. issues with their own faith traditions, their exactly, own intellectual exactly. history. Exactly. So it's, it's you know, you know why, for example, why is it, okay, why is it so crazy Again, you don't have to believe the Quran is revelation. If you believe the if you believe the Quran was made up by the prophet and you you think the prophet was a fraud, okay, you're you know you don't believe, okay. But why is it so crazy to say the Quran comes from like mid seventh century Arabia? Is that that insane? They're like, no, no, that can't be the case. That's not how religion works. Scripture changes over time. It can't actually the story can't actually be right, the, right. the you know the real story can't <laughs> actually be what we hear and reread history books. There has to be something to uncover. So again, because this is their own Western experience with the Old Testament, with the New Testament, with the history of the early church. Right, which exactly. Which beginning in the 1700s, they start, to, you know, Western scholars start to really like, you know, they start discovering these early, the writings of early church fathers that talk about not gospels that aren't in the canon and things like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, but you also see and, like- And other non-Western traditions as well. I mean, the, the scriptures of, you know, of East Asia and things like that, there's not, there's, there's, there's a similar pattern in terms of the history of- the religious literature, right? I mean, it's not like you have this one, uh, one. Well, yeah, I mean, that be, you know? yeah, that's true. But the, some, their scriptural traditions tend to be like very n not comparable to kind of the Abrahamic mm -hmm. tradition. We sure, talk about sure, the Abrahamic sure. tradition, you know, it's really one family, you right? Know? It's like comparing different brothers, like how they're doing in school, uh -huh. or, or <laughs> yeah. like which brother, which son's a doctor, <laughs> is the younger which one, one isn't the a younger doctor. one's always doing better. <laughs> but I think also just to kind of like segue a little bit back. You know, you have these critiques of you know people like Hollins uh, under the sword of Islam or whatever it was, and you know <clears throat> the shadow of the sword, the shadow of the sword or whatever it was, and then there's a documentary, and he's like going off to these archaeological sites in Jordan and finding some supposed you know early mosque that's in the wrong direction and that's some sort of evidence of. I know Subhanallah, you know Muslim built. Uh, you know, didn't have GPS and, you know, built some mosques in the wrong direction. So, Pat, you know what's really amazing about early mosques is they're generally always pointing in roughly the right, right. direction. Like yeah. If you go, For example, if you go to the Kaidoween Mosque in Fez, right, 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 the, yeah. they, they have the Qibla slightly different off. because they, <laughs> they, you know, you're like, they realized it. But you're yeah. like, subhanAllah, you know, I don't know, like, I don't know the Qibla in my hotel room. Right. You know. Uh, well, even in Spain, everyone, obviously, as Muslims, you know, you may see images of this amazing mihrab in, like, in the mosque of like Cordoba in the Grand Mosque of Cordoba though but the, what people may not realize it goes due south the, yeah. you know it's like straight into Africa but at the time I think it may shatter some of our own notions of our own scientific accomplishments sometimes but I think it also shows that like oh, these things happen you yeah know? of course I mean of course man I mean to think about you know I would I remember I was praying the wrong direction in my office for like five years <laughs> You know, <laughs> I think so, we've all been there. Yeah. Someone came and told me like, well, why are you praying this direction? I was like, oh no, this is the Qibla. I was like, that's not the Qibla. <laughs> so the, I mean, like, but the fact, what's interesting is, and there's a really good book called Islam is, uh, Islam is Others Saw It by Robert Hoyland, mm -hmm. not, um, not Tom Holland's, Robert Hoyland. Um, and in it, he has a really good discussion of, of one of the, one of the things he looks at is these early mosques. Because what he shows is that people, you know, contra actually, Totally contrary to the idea that these early mosques show that the, the qibla changed, or, you know, it's, you know, in the early Islamic history. No, no, actually, uh, they're generally pointing towards Mecca, and when they're not, they're just they just made a mistake. 
So then another question that comes up is also when we go back to the historical, you know, official Sunni narrative, obviously understanding that in the Shi'i tradition, there may be discussions on Sayyidina Ali's composition of the Quran. There may be discussions of other Sahabas who had compilations of the Quran. And sometimes those are brought up even in the early theology or maybe in the classical age by opponents of mainstream or that orthodoxy that was emerging let's put it that way because i think a lot of times we make a mistake of saying that sunni islam was just sunni islam from day one without any development um but um, um salama the wife of the prophet is credited at least in in muslim lore and also through the hadith narratives that she had a kind of final version of the prophet's quran you mean hafsa hafsa apologies yes good correct okay. yeah sorry so, i was like i was like well i don't know about sorry. this <laughs> I was going to need to read my notes. I think notes he was trying time. to test you, Dr. Brown. <laughs> yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, I was trying to. <laughs> you passed. So anyways, <laughs> so you have a wife of the Prophet ﷺ, you know, who has this compilation of the Quran. And then that then becomes the basis for the Uthmani Codex. Is that a reasonable Yeah, assumption? so what's really interesting about um, early Islamic history is, you know, Muslim scholars, they're not, um, they're not trying to, like, cover something up because... They, you, you see them trying to write about, like, you know, for example, scholars like a Zuhri in the, in the, the mid 700s or in the mid 800s, mid 900s, you know, they, they're, they're sitting there being like, okay, uh, what's the relationship between this, this Mus'haf that gets compiled, the Mus'haf of Hafsa, right? So after the, during the Caliphate Abu Bakr, uh, a lot of companions get killed in one battle in Yamama. And so uh, Omar, radiallahu ta'ala, who has this concern that, you know, we need to like actually write the Quran down. And there's this Abu Bakr's, you know, I, I don't want to do something the Prophet didn't do, but he gets convinced, like, this is serious. We need to actually have written compilation. So he has Zayd ibn Thabit, who's a, a Medina. This is very interesting. Zayd ibn and, Thabit. And just if I can interject, and, and there, uh, just for our listeners, the Quran was written down uh, in different, it wasn't, it was, it was written down during the time of the Prophet in terms of different, like, um, yeah, people had compiled, different, people had so their own the notes, like, but there was no official version. There was no version. compilation of, there was no of official everything, version, right? right? Yeah. Um, now, again, it's important to remember, they didn't have paper. They didn't have actually very easy materials to write on. And right, writing, writing materials are really expensive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Zayd ibn Thabit, who uh, was is from Medina, right? And he, in Medina, the, the only written tradition was the Jewish population of Medina. So Zayd ibn Thabit had been to the Jewish schools in Medina. And he knew how to write Syriac. He knew how to write Hebrew, mm, wow. right? And he knew how to write Arabic. So he's put in charge of basically going around and getting all the different, uh, looking at all the different written copies that are, that are notes that are out there. To, of course, the Quran is mainly preserved in the hearts of the Muslims and in their memories. So he goes and gets at least two uh, witnesses for every verse of the Quran. And then he uh, creates this, this written version that stays with the, the prophet's wife, uh, widow, and the daughter of Omar, Hafsa. And uh, then uh, during the Caliphate of Uthman, around so he's Uthman uh, rules from 644 to 656 of the Common Era, and uh, he uh, basically uh, there's some question: Does does he base it on the Hafsa Mushaf? Um, does he sort of start totally uh, fresh? Because it's again Zaydim and Thabit and a committee who are assigned with creating this official version. So it seems like the best uh, evidence is that he looked at the uh, Hafsa Mushaf, he certainly took this into consideration, but he actually did the whole process again as well. And so then that version, uh, after that, all the other Mushaf are destroyed. Now there's the Mushaf of Ali, which is, again, doesn't survive. There's no, zero, so, but the reports are that Ali's Mushaf was ordered chronologically. Right, very is it, is it Ibn Masood also, isn't there? No, Ibn Masood was not ordered chronologically. Oh, okay. Ibn Masood's Mushaf actually, his, his, Re, his version of the Quran, not his physical Mus'haf, but his kind of copies of his Mus'haf actually survived. And in fact, there's one scholar in the, in the 900s in Baghdad named Ibn Shambud who gets, uh, he's, to, he's reading the uh, Ibn Mas'ud uh, version in the mosque. And uh, he gets told to stop doing this, and he refuses, and he gets be be beaten up. <laughs> he gets not beaten up like by a crowd. That doesn't happen anymore. He gets no disciplined more by the, by the caliph. <laughs> But the Ibn Mas'ud, even if the Ibn Mas'ud Mus'haf uh, doesn't differ from the Uthmanic Mus'haf, except in very small, small ways. Uh, so the, uh, the one that we know most about, besides the, 
besides the, uh, the obviously the the Uthmanic Codex, the, the official one, it's this Ibn Mas'ud Mus'haf. But uh, we only know, uh, you know, we don't have the, I don't think we have the, the full thing, but we have Muslim scholars did a pretty good job of recording, okay, this is where the Ibn Mas'ud Mus'haf dis- differed from the Mus'haf we have. So this brings up another question about, you know, versions, basically, but also wording. <clears throat> we mentioned that basically that the evidence suggests that the Prophet was the original um, uh, source, at least in terms of where verses should go, and obviously being inspired by Allah, you know, for that composition. But when we look at some of the structural, um, deep structural similarities to the Quran, like nowadays you have studies by Raymond Farron and other uh, like academics around this whole idea of ring theory, or mm. you know, so how do you see that it is a, as a possible way for Muslims in modernity to kind of look at the Quran? maybe anew and see that there's this amazing structure to the Quran and that obviously this is just further evidence of that. Because we see this with, you know, obviously when the Birmingham, um, when that manuscript was uh, announced and Muslims were very um, uh, happy because the dating corresponded to the dating of the of the, of the time of the Prophet So how do you see these things as well, maybe I mean, that, helping That Muslims? is just different. The first part of your question is about like the actual... Um, Kind of the, almost the literary nature of the, the Quran, and the second one's about the again the issue of yeah, historical authenticity. Uh, you know, the historical authenticity. Uh, well, maybe you guys will publish my um, my blog pieces on that. I wrote some good stuff on the Birmingham Quran pages. Oh, definitely, I'll do it. Yeah, it's on your website, so our yeah, listeners can. But also no one ever goes to my website, so you should publish them on uh, okay on Emanwire. So yeah, I really uh, I've made some, I think pretty humorous remarks in those, those <laughs> articles. So the, uh, the the question you're talking about is like kind of like, what, how do you, from a literary or you know, narrative or you know, interpretive perspective, meaning uh, how does the Quran work? And of course, this has been a big, big source of, um, of question for um, not just Muslim scholars, but also Western scholars, right? Because, you know, uh, you have, uh, the, the Quran doesn't follow like a narrative framework, you know, it doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have an end, you know, there's certain, like for example, Surah Joseph, uh, Yusuf has an, is a narrative, but a lot of the other uh, surahs, you know, you have a story and then it'll jump to another issue and then another story or maybe a series of stories that are connected. And, and the question is, you know, is, does a surah even have some unity or is it just, is it, is it essentially a stream of consciousness? And there's one scholar, uh, his name is Farhan Al Farahi, in the um, yes, in the uh, 12th a, century. Yes, he's a, he's an amazing scholar. Yeah. I think we had a discussion about him not that long ago. But yeah, go ahead. Really? Okay. Well, maybe I don't I don't know that much about him, but I mean this. But this scholar had this idea that you know every every surah has like a has a has a pillar, has like a central pillar that it's built around. And Nazm al Quran, I think, was was his. Yes, yeah, so Nazm al Quran is a big issue of you know the the how to what what is the order. Um, what does the order tell us, not only within the surah, but also but like the order of the surahs in relationship to one another? Right, the connection, like the beginning uh, of one surah with yeah. the end of the previous one and then the end of So the you, have, you have two questions, right? So what is, you know, why are surahs ordered in the way they were? You know, why is uh, Baqarah after, uh, you know, why is Ma'idah after Baqarah? And then why you think, and then the other question is, you know, within surah al-Ma'idah or within surah al-Nisa, like, why are the, why is it ordered the way it is? And does these do these does each theory surah have some uh, theme or unity? Um, so uh, there's a book that came out uh, pretty recently. It's originally in French, but it's uh, I think the uh, the uh, author is not Muslim, as far as I know. Is um, quite, it's really hard to pronounce. Quapers. It's a Q U. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't I, even know how to Quapers yeah, or know. something like that. Right. So it's called the Banquet. And it's about Surah Al Maidah, and it's it's a it's a huge book. I mean, it's a whole volume just on the ordering and literary. I mean, and it's fascinating. I mean, when you read this as a Muslim, you're like, oh my god, like I've just never thought about this stuff. It's really interesting. It's really. It's, I recommend people get the book and you know, read it. It's in English now, and um, and uh, you know you could just, like imagine writing a whole volume about just like the ordering of Maida. And then, you know, you could do that for every surah. And so I think that uh, this is something that's like, it's like a, a, it's something that, that's like a a fresh field almost. I mean, it's just barely been touched by scholars and, and uh, even Muslim scholars, I think, you know, barely scratch the surface of this. 
I thought that Raymond Farron's treatment of it was interesting. I mean, it's not a it's not a large work either, it's a, but it does reference the the banquet that uh, that you mentioned. Uh, is this interesting? Because I think as we read the Quran, we don't always notice these things, and um, I'm sure there's like I don't know. There yeah, is. like you know, like <clears throat> some people have begun to analyze, or I mean, I've heard some analysis. Like so, like you know, sort of that's like twenty verses, like verse one verses and verse twenty have a yeah. parallel two and nineteen. Three and you know yeah then like I mean that. even just yeah. the first uh, like the first verses of Iqra, of Surah Al Alaq that are revealed they have that in this in the um, syllables the number of syllables they have that ring structure yeah mm. so it is so it, it's uh, you know I, I think it's just you know if you're you know Muslims are used to like oh did you know like you know the Quran predicted um, <laughs> you know gelato or something like that you, but the, you know the, the when you actually so I mean I think sometimes we can be skeptical about this right. but when you read these analyses you're like oh my god I mean I really just have not been appreciative enough about of this work right so what I wanted to also talk about is also the idea of wording and maybe how that impacted from the early manuscripts the different styles of recitation. Or was it that the recitation impacted the manuscript? Recitation, you mean qara'a? Yeah, the qara'a. Readings. Yeah, the readings. Yeah. Um, well, this is a fascinating topic. So there's this, I mean, I don't want to get into... Okay, so I mean, there's an interesting question, right? Which is, you have, like, what is the, the Qur'an? Okay, is the, the general idea is, I mean, I think it's correct to say, that, you know, the Qur'an... And you often hear people say, like, oh, you know, you say, oh, give me that Qur'an. And someone's like, no, don't say that. <laughs> like, give me the Mus'haf, you know, like the Quran is, you know, so like, you know, that's not, the, we think about like the, the Quran is this like book you hold or whatever. No, the, the Quran is something you recite. The, the Mus'haf is just a kind of like a package, almost a skeleton that you use to, to, to store this thing, store this, this, uh, this revelation. Um, but uh, there is clearly like a uh, reciprocal interaction between the written tradition and the recited tradition, right? Uh, so you have uh, the, 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 when Muslims start to write down, uh, the Arabic alphabet is formalized to write the Quran down. This is what people understand. The Arabic alphabet prior to Islam was not, a, not the Arabic alphabet we know. It was basically like a pidgin language you use to write you know, shopping lists and, you know, contracts and stuff like that. You, it didn't, it wasn't a standalone alphabet. So things like adding dots to distinguish between like a B and a T and a TH or a DOD and a SOD or a, a THA and a TA, this is actually uh, done during the first, essentially during, we know it's the first 13 years of the, after the death of the prophet. They start these, using these dots. And then in the, uh, several Within the first couple of decades, they start using the uh, vowel markers to difference between you know mulk and milk and melek, right? Uh, so sometimes uh, but could that be just because there's also a lot of non-Muslims coming into? Yeah, Islam? exactly. Well, they 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 right. they're Muslim, right. it goes from basically a very small community to being a much larger. And you have like people community. like Duali and all these people who yeah, are, yeah. Abu uh, Abu Duali. He's the one who's credited with uh, from this genera generation of the successors. So. Um, they, there, this, but the Quran is already being. There's also not one Arabic language. So the Arabic language is just the language that is spoken in the Hejaz and like probably the Tamim tribe in Central Arabia. And there's lo so many dialects of Arabic, and some of them are like borderline other languages. So the Arabic language, as you know, classical Arabic, it actually comes out of the the Quranic Arabic. It's created by the Quranic Arabic. But because, for example, there's in the Hejaz, in the Hejazi Arabic, they didn't have the medial Hamza. So when you say, for example, Mu'min, that's not how the Hejazis would say that. They'd say Mu'min. So in the Warsh reading of the Quran, right. they don't say Mu'minun, they say Mu'minun, right? That's the way this is used in Morocco. Basically, the only place it's used in, is in Morocco. So if you go to Morocco, you can buy a Mus'haf that's like a Warsh reading. <laughs> or, for example, they don't say uh, Maliki Yawmidin, they say Maliki Yawmidin, right? Um, no, wait, instead of Maliki Yawmidin, they say Maliki Yawmidin. I'm yeah. getting mi mixed up. So the, uh, or in they say like, instead of uh, Kufu, Kufu Wan Ahad, they say Kufu An, like not Kufu Wan, Kufu An. 
So very small differences. But the, this medial Hamza comes from the Tamim tribe. So this big tribe in Central Arabia, they said things, Mu'min. So their dialect actually influence, it becomes like the official dialect of the Quran. Uh, the, of the, not the Quran, but of most of the readings of the Quran. Whereas the Warsh preserves that original Hijazi reading. So part of the original diversity is that you have like, it would be like having a guy from Alabama, like a really thick Alabama accent. And then like a guy from, you know, Boston, a thick Boston accent, and then like a Scottish guy and, a, you know, Daisy uncle. And like, they're all reading the same book. And yet they, it sounds different, even though it's the same book. But uh, those readings are all originally authentic kind of readings of the book. Okay, but then you have instances where the writing uh, can influence reading. So in Surah Al-Hujurat, the, the verse, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقُونَ بِنَبَأٍ فَتَبَيَّنُوا Right, so if, a, if, a, if an iniquitous person comes to you with some piece of information, تَبَيَّنُوا means, you know, to seek clarification, you know, and make sure this is... Accurate, right? But uh, in the Hamza and Kisa'i, so these are the two of the seven uh, canonical narrations. It says, uh, فتثبتو. Now, unlike, you know, Kufu'an, Kufu'an, this you can see like this is the same sound, almost just like an accent difference. But Tabayanu and Tathebatu, it's not sound, it doesn't sound the same, but it's written almost exactly the same way. Wow. So there's a possibility, which is that, okay, well, Hamza and Kisa'i just got this wrong, and it's Tabayanu. If you know, if you can, if you can picture Arabic alphabet, right? Tabayanu and Tathebatu, uh, Ba and Tha are just different dottings of the same word. Right, so there could right? have been theoretically a wrong so, transcription. Or, so that's one possibility. One possibility is just Kisa'i and Al-Kisa'i and Hamza were just wrong about this because there was a confusion in the writing, and the majority is correct, Tabayanu. But another possibility is that that diversity actually exists as like a, uh, uh, a rahma or like an instruction from God because tathabatu means make some, so tabayinu make, means seek clarification. Tathabatu means authenticate something. Mm. So like different layers of meaning. Yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, when you, if someone comes, like did, right? If someone comes to you and says, hey, did you hear that, you know, uh, Sheikh so and so said that, uh, you know, you're allowed to drink uh, vodka or something during Ramadan. You're like, um, Tathabatu, Tabayinu would be see clarification. Tathabatu is like, it's like, did he actually say this? <laughs> you know, like, okay, no, it turns out this is some, you know, idiot who reported this. He never actually said this. So the Tabayinu and Tathabatu contain the two elements of seek clarification and understanding and then seek authentication in, in actually attestation of this report. Another example is like, uh, you know, the, the story of Harut and Marut. These two angels. So, um, Malek is angel, and these angels come and they kind of have uh, sort of some like unproductive magic that they or unproductive powers that God has given them, or they sort of twist the powers they're given and they use it to spread corruption in the world. But then the problem is, wait a second, like angels are not supposed to have free will, right? Right. So how can angels do stuff? Right. You could say, well, God allowed that or God gave them the ability or something. But then uh, uh, this actually in uh, uh, Al-Baqilani, who's one of the, he dies in uh, 303, 913 of the common era, 303 Hijri, 913 of the common era. He's one of the like founders of the Ashari school of theology. So he, and then another scholar in the 18th, 19th century, Imam al-Bajuri, Burhan Din al-Bajuri, the Sheikh al-Azhar, they have this theory that it's not Malak, it's Malik. Malik is king. So, and it's just a voweling difference. It's written exactly the same way. So maybe these are not two angels, these are two kings who are like causing all these problems. And then that's like, oh, that makes, then, then you don't have that issue anymore. Right. So you resolve that tension. So uh, there's sometimes these different vowelings actually uh, create possibilities of meaning that help us understand the Quran better. And I think that's a good point to kind of like show people that there's a lot of nuance to this discussion. We're not trying to bring up issues that people may have not thought of. But obviously, we're trying to encourage critical thinking on this point. And so... But and again, by the way, none of this stuff is, you know, Jonathan Brown, you know, pulling this out of <laughs> this some weird theory he has or some, you know, Western scholar has this theory. This is all straight out of Islamic tradition. Yeah. And I think it should be noted that the Islamic tradition is a very rich tradition. Oftentimes, people want a very simple answer, thinking that there was a seamless stream 
you know, there's a line directly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Well, I think there is. There is a direct line yeah, to the Prophet. Is, but, but we have to think about, so when we think about English, like, you just have to think about language differently. So why, you know, the way that we think about a language in terms of English is not the quote unquote correct way and then other people are messed up, right? We have a very specific, so in English, we write vowels, okay? By the way, up until like the 10 hundreds in, in writing in Germanic languages, like they wouldn't split the words up. So imagine you know, sometimes you get like book, books that are badly printed and there's no spaces between words. Like imagine actually reading a book that has no space between words. Right. And then somebody decided, we're like, we should really put space between words, right? So, but the idea that we write vowels, Arabs don't do that. Even to this day, they don't you know, write in the newspaper. You don't have short vowels written. You just have to know this stuff. So the idea that what you see on the page can only be one word. You know, you can debate like, what does car mean? Is a car like a roller coaster car or a car like a train car or a car, right. you know, whatever, but it's just car. It's C-A-R. It can't be anything else, right? Um, but in Arabic, it's just C-R. So it could be car, it could be cur, it could be care, it could be, um, I don't know, you know, so many, something so many, else, right? Yeah, but right. the point is like, you know, that's just a different way of thinking about language. And so it's not, it doesn't mean that the, the Quran is not one intact uh, entity across time. It's just the nature of language, it, the, the language of that entity is different from the way we think about language in English. Well, mashallah, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Brown for joining us for on a very uh, interesting discussion. And um, I want to thank Irfan for, for joining us again. I got all my questions answered. If you didn't, maybe you should leave a comment and when we post this up. That was excellent. And go oh, read yeah, this yeah. banquet book. <laughs> and also, uh, Dr. Dr. Mustafa Azami, rahimahullah, his history of the Quranic text is an excellent, excellent book. And it's now been published in a new edition. So there it's you got go. pictures okay. and everything. So we, we touched on a lot of topics, a couple of books. Raymond Farron's structure of the Quran was talked about. The banquet was talked about, and Dr. Azami's work as well on on the on the history of the Quran text. You guys should definitely count and that. Dr. Brown's articles. Which oh yeah, are obviously. On his going website. To, no, no one they're going to be on Emanuel. They right now they're on their on the website. So Yo, you know, well, why why don't you make them on Emanuel? So we will fast, put them. We and will. You, can, <laughs> <laughs> you know how long it takes. You know, most of them. You guys things, right? know. It takes you no time at all. <laughs> so we will get them on EUR, Eman Wire sooner inshallah, rather than later. In July, you can follow Dr. Brown and all of his academic accolades and everything that's happening. So good luck. Also, cop Miss Cody Muhammad, if you haven't heard that, heard about that book, you should have. It's a great read. Yeah, as always a pleasure, Dr. Brown. My we pleasure, hope guys. to have you on again. Uh, to our listeners, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, remember visiting monwar.com for latest uh, episodes and articles. And uh, until then, as alaykum. Peace be unto you. As-salamu alaykum.